Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Korean Studies Department at Babeshko University in Cluj-Napoca, Romania. I am pleased to introduce to you a very special guest, Dr. Andrew Logi. Dr. Logi is Assistant Professor of Korean Studies at the University of Helsinki. He has done extensive research on the histi historiography of early Northern East Asia, publishing articles that make comparative approaches to early Korea and a mainland, mainland Southeast Asia, Korean New Religions and 20th century popular music history. He is a graduate of the School of Oriental and African Studies, SOAS, uh, the University of London, and completed his doctoral studies at the University of Helsinki, and then did a postdoc at Leiden University. Uh, currently, he is in charge of the Korean Studies program at the University of Helsinki. Today, he will be presenting a, le a lecture on current trends on pseudo history in South Korea. The lecture is uh, supported by a special funding program of the AXE, the Association for Korean Studies in Europe and the Korea Foundation. I would like to give the floor to Dr. Andrew Logi um, and also invite the 70 or so students attending the lecture to ask questions at the end of the lecture. Thank you for coming. Dr. Logi, please. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, really uh, nice to see so many students. Um, good that you have your cameras on now. When we go into the lecture, of course, it's okay if you want to uh, switch off your cameras for that time. Um, but very nice to see you. Uh, wish I could be there in person to do that, to do this, but of course, under current circumstances, we're working under uh, through Zoom. Um, so I'm in Helsinki. Luckily, we're on the we have the same uh, time um, as Romania, but Finland and Romania are in the same time zone, so um, uh, that makes it convenient. Um, oh, I actually correct just slightly about the introduction. So um, mention of my published articles. Um, I haven't yet published on comparative history with Southeast Asia. Um, but that's a it's an ambition of mine and it's something I'm working <clears throat> something I'm working on uh, so I hope very much that in the near future that will become a true description of uh, uh, my research um, but everything else is uh, true um, and I've been working on historiography so the study of history um, particularly of popular history writing about early career and as we'll see today, uh, uh, unfortunately, um, quite a large portion of that deals with the issue of pseudo history, meaning is essentially fake uh, history. Um, so we'll see, uh, basically today, the aim is to get a taste of um, uh, some of the issues involved. Um, feel free as well as, I'll look forward to questions and answers certainly at the end. Uh, there's potentially a lot in this, uh, in this topic uh, and in the presentation, almost certainly uh, I will forget things or there won't quite be time to go into certain topics. I haven't quite put everything into the presentation either. Um, so your questions are very welcome and we can explore some other areas as well. I can uh, elaborate uh, on some of what I go through now, hoping I get through it. Um, if I end up going on too long, uh, Kodruta, I'm sure, will, uh, can I welcome her to interrupt me um, and uh, if we need to take a break, etc. So uh, let's do this. I'm going to uh, share my screen. So hopefully you can see the presentation okay. Yes. And here we are. Um, so this presentation goes under various names or the topic can go under various names. So at the moment, the title that I work with is this uh, enticement of ancient empire or making career great again. 
with a question mark being very important there. Um, broadly, uh, this topic, as I try to discuss it, uh, covers both um, the phenomenon of pseudo history uh, as it is, um, and its relationship to uh, religions in Korea, often termed as new religions. Um, so there's basically an overlap of two topics um, and the phenomena of pseudo history in South Korea today, um, this is a key aspect of it that there is, it, it stretches between secular pseudo history that presents itself as um, academic history, uh, albeit and also popular history. Um, but then also uh, this very similar content or the same content, um, which is taught within uh, certain new religions as well. So there's an overlap um, between certain new religions and the secular side, the, 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 the false uh, scholarly side of um, the uh, issue of pseudo, pseudo history. So basically, I'm going to try and give a taste of some of this today, but I won't be able to cover everything. Um, but of course, through your questions, we might uh, be able to touch on other topics as well. Um, so to begin very briefly, Korean pseudo history in two maps. So I'm going to be saying pseudo history a lot uh, today um, and specifically relating to Korean pseudo history. We're going to come back to these maps several times as well. Um, but just to introduce kind of the shape of things. Um, so one key concept of Korean pseudo history, so how believers imagine ancient Korea, um, is the idea of ancient Korea uh, under the name of Old Joseon, Kuo Joseon, uh, being a continental empire, this expansive, so we see on the map this very expansive uh, territory covering, not, not um, incoincidentally, uh, Manchuria, um, the shape of Manchuria we here, have here, continental Manchuria. Um, so this is one concept. Uh, Old Chosun, you may have heard of if you've been studying um, early Korean history. So Old Chosun is a historical state, and there's a long tradition in Korea itself of um, imagining Old Chosun as the first state in Korean history. So it comes with tradition already um, that dates to at least the 13th century um, from most famously the source, the um, Samguk Yusa, uh, which again, you may have heard of. Um, so from that is derived the traditional date, foundation date of um, 2333 BCE. Um, and then historically as a state, uh, we know that Old Chosun came to an end in 108 BCE uh, when it was invaded and conquered, overthrown by uh, Han Dynasty China um, around the state of 108 BCE. Um, so in the view of pseudo history, uh, they take these as rough dates, um, but a key aspect of pseudo history is that they reject the idea of Old Chosun having been invaded and overthrown by China. Um, but anyway, this is the image of Old Chosun as an empire. Um, the second of two representations of uh, pseudo history um, is the idea of a proto-civilization, something even older than Old Chosun. And this goes by the name of Huanguk. And you see these dates here, which are ex extremely uh, ancient. Um, so 7,198 BCE um, is given as the foundation date of uh, Huanguk. Um, and there are many maps uh, in different uh, sources, different recently published pseudo history sources that will show Huanguk um, quite vaguely as this enormous place, um, essentially somewhere in Central Asia, uh, often associated with the um, uh, Altai Mountains or the Pamir Mountains. This map is very loose, as you see, it's just this huge zone 
uh, covering a kind of trans-Eurasian uh, area. Um, so this is imagined as a proto-civilization, the very origin um, of world civilization. And then somehow within that, um, the lineage to Korea, and we see arrows pointing towards the, the area we've just looked at, the continent, Manchurian continent and the pin Korean peninsula. So imagining a strong continuity between the proto-civilization of Hwanguk and then later stages. Um, in between, there's Hwanguk um, at these dates, and then there's Old Choson. In between those um, is something that gets a period and the idea of an area most often gets referred to with this term here, pedal. Um, We'll see this again, but they like to mix in various different terms. So here it's described as the Palhe civilization. Um, and you may have heard of Palhe uh, from, uh, I'll, I'll have to use some simple terms like real history to distinguish pseudo history. So in real history, um, there actually, of course, is a medieval state of Palhe. Um, and it's, uh, so it's also used as kind of a geographical designation. So this area here, in this map is being called Palhe civilization. From Huanguk also um, spreads out uh, all the other uh, civilizations, certainly of the um, Northern hemisphere. Um, so small arrow coming down to um, Chinese civilization of the Yellow River, um, arrows going into the West uh, for the establishment of the Sumer civilization which is taken in these schemes, Sumer is taken as the beginnings of Western civilization as well. So from Sumer, you get Mesopotamia um, and from there spreads to ancient Egypt and ancient Greece and then European civilization. So this arrow uh, deals with Western civilization. And then there's an arrow that shoots off and we'll see later on uh, goes over the Bering Straits to um, America as well. Um, so this is the proto-civilization uh, that Koreans in this scheme, they make a special claim to. So even though it's the origin for all world civilization, they somehow within that try to emphasize a more direct uh, inheritance uh, by, the Korea, by Korean civilization. And this is imagined the time, uh, uh, time timeline of this, a chronology. Um, looks very complicated. I've tried to add some English to pick out something. So if we look at just the, the middle line at the moment, um, we see what we've just mentioned here. Here's old Chorson. And then if we go back in time, uh, so 233 BCE, before that is the Pedal uh, period. And then before that is uh, Huanguk. Um, and it says here, Ilure Hwangum Shijol. So at the very beginning is uh, humanity's golden age. So the narrative imagined, the trajectory imagined is of an ancient golden age, um, really including Hwanguk, but they put it right at the um, beginning. Um, and then this uh, continues uh, gradually less golden, um, but still up to Old Chosun, it's still quite a good golden age. Um, but still there's a sense of a decline. So it's imagining um, some super ancient golden age, uh, this uh, primeval period, uh, and then the unfolding of history as we know it from legendary periods into medieval history um, as a gradual decline. Um, so that's the central line. Uh, if we zoom out, we'll see this follows the rest of Korean history. Up here, we have a timeline of Chinese history. Um, and probably the most important feature is that China starts um, slightly later. Uh, this is the legend, this is some um, very legendary uh, era of China. Um, and then the Yellow River civilization starting basically the same time, they accept the traditional dates of old Chorson. So Yellow River civilization starting about the same time. Um, here we have the, the early Chinese uh, dynasties so, of um, the, not quite agreed upon, slightly legendary Xia dynasty, and then the more archaeologically confirmed uh, Shang dynasty, and then Zhou, and then the spring and autumn period, etc. So then it goes into early Chinese uh, history. 
Um, and down and down at the bottom here, we have the Indian, the Indus uh, civilization of the Indus River um, here. So their main point is to try to make uh, very much sure that Korea, if we associate old Chorson uh, with the traditional understanding of being the beginning of Korea, you see how they make the direct line through Hwanguk Pedal to old Chorson, while everything else is more of kind of an offshoot uh, from this main uh, line. Obviously, this map is, uh, this timeline, this chronology uh, is created for Koreans. Um, it's in Korean language as well. So it's also Korean centric, partly for that reason too. If we zoom out, then we can see the broader version of this. Um, so old Chorson, here, just above in the green, we get uh, the Japanese timeline, um, starting with the Jomon period, the Yayo Yayoi period here. Um, so most key here is that um, to emphasize uh, that old Chorson predates the beginnings of uh, Japanese history. So Japan is slightly later than the or early development of Korean civilization. Um, then it goes into the rest of the timeline is actually uh, quite reasonably accurate, um, as you would learn in um, uh, history classes. Um, so it goes into a very busy period of uh, um, the Buyo state, the Samhan. Uh, and then where I put Kogulio here, that's the three kingdoms, and it's got all of the three kingdoms uh, listed there. Then uh, Palhe, which they name as Tejin here, and uh, Unified Shilla. And then we've got Koryo dynasty, Choson dynasty, and this actually goes all the way up to uh, modern 20th century history. Um, so here's uh, Teha Minguk, South Korea, and here's uh, Choson Minju Juria in Mingongwaguk, North Korea, the DPRK. Um, and it calls this uh, the period of Southern and Northern division, uh, which is uh, what we're still in now. So, and on the bottom here, before we just noted the Indus uh, civilization, but then they list further down um, the Middle Eastern civilizations and then going into European uh, history. Um, while we're still awake, as this is, we're still quite early on in the presentation. So um, here's a bit of uh, um, ideas, some, some attempt at um, theory on this. Uh, so uh, we'll, I'll just kind of state these arguments, um, but they, we, you don't need to memorize them for the sake of this presentation. Um, so I propose that current day South Korean pseudo historians, um, they have been affected in promoting two fields of cultural or official public memory. And these fields, because they're promoted by pseudo historians, they're, I would argue they are, they are fake fields of memory. They're invented fields of memory. So one of these is the idea, as we just seen in the maps, ancient Korea as a continental empire. Um, and if you like, you can also include the, the Pedal and Hwanguk going further back. So that's their um, uh, claim um, for ancient history. Then in the red color here, um, I suggest that regarding uh, their current identity, the association of this um, historiography, this pseudo historiography with anti-Japanese, anti-South Korean conservative, progressive, ethno-nationalist South Korean left political identities. That's a very big mouthful. Um, I should have made it into a real sentence as well. Um, so they, they claim that their idea of ancient history and their view of history they try to associate the, the current day tradition of promoting this history as something uh, patriotic um, framed in these terms as being representing anti-Japanese in the 20th century. That's a reaction to colonialism and um, uh, associating this line of historiography with an independence movement as, it, as if the writers of this history were anti-Japanese. Um, by extension, anti-South Korean conservative, which would refer uh, most immediately into the Park Jong-hee um, period of con uh, his, uh, South Korean conservatism that's men maintained in the conservative uh, politics of South Korea today. 
um, and therefore they associate themselves, people who promote this idea of ancient Korean empire, they see themselves as being progressive, um, essentially South Korean left wing, um, often associated with the notion of uh, Minjok Jui, you may have heard of this ethno nationalism. Um, so this is something that's found uh, in the, the, even the mainstream left wing politics of recent decades um, in recent South Korean politics, including under the current Moon Jae-in administration, um, their politics, they self-identify as um, left-wing uh, progressives, um, but they are very open and supportive to the ideas of pseudo-history uh, pertaining to ancient Korea, the ideas of um, this ancient uh, continental empire. They support this idea. Um, and they give expression to that sometimes. Um, this idea of uh, pseudo history being um, anti Japanese um, supports a strategy they use that is to say, people who do not agree with our view of history, so people who say that our history is pseudo history, that say there wasn't this huge empire, ancient empire, they are under the influence of colonial era Japanese historiography. That refers to the early 20th century, the period, um, most literally 1910 to 1945, the period of the Japanese occupation. So they have a conspiracy theory that says, we used to have this grand history and we had records of it and everyone knew this, this grand history but under the period, especially of the colonial period, under the Japanese, this history was destroyed and it was buried and the Japanese imposed um, what, what, from, what from the position of Korean pseudo-historians they would view as pseudo-history themselves. Um, they would say that the Japanese imposed a view of Korean history that tried to diminish ancient Korea, that tried to hide the, the truth of this secret ancient empire. Um, so they deploy this idea of, um, they accuse anyone who criticizes them uh, of being themselves uh, influenced by Japanese colonial historiography of being today being pro-Japanese. And this is very literal. So professional scholars in South Korea who openly challenge and criticize the content of pseudo history they risk, um, and very often they are, accused of being pro-Japanese um, under the um, frame of this uh, colonial historiography conspiracy theory. And in Korean politics today, this is still being accused of being pro-Japanese. It's not very constructive, um, but it's very emotive, um, even in current day political discourse uh, in Korea due to obvious sensitivities from the experience of the 20th century with Japan. At the same time as um, uh, promoting these ideas, pseudo historians also um, practice two forms of forgetting or denialism. Um, so historical denialism, saying that certain things did not happen or ignoring them. So in, under the blue pertaining to ancient history, the, the, one of the key examples of this is to deny um, the ancient history, the historicity of the Chinese Hun commanderies. Um, and these were the commanderies that were established following the Hun Chinese conquest of old Chaucon. So you see the date of 108 BCE. One of these commanderies, the Lulang commandery, originally there were four, um, but very quickly they were reorganized down to two. Um, and the key one, the Lulang Commandery, was located at modern day Pyongyang, the capital of North Korea. Um, and there's archaeological evidence for this, um, but pseudo historians dispute that. Um, this Lulang Commandery lasted historically around 400 years, as we see 108 BC to 313 CE, um, or AD, uh, if you will. Uh, so pseudo historians say this didn't happen. They say it's 400 year um, presence of the Lowland commandery occupation, however you want to view it, they say it simply didn't happen. 
um, they have various explanations. Either they say it just didn't happen, the invasion failed, um, or they say that uh, historical geography is actually a bit different and the Luland commandery, it was historical, but it was established not in Korea, but actually in what is part of current day China in Hebei province, um, for example. Uh, similarly, they um, another example of denialism is concerning early Korea Japan interactions. Um, that gets very uh, kind of going into details. That gets quite um, uh, well. It gets detailed. It's so very time consuming to go into that. Um, but there's historical evidence of interactions, uh, archaeological evidence, historical evidence of interactions between peoples understood as being ethnic Japanese, um, the Wa or in Korean, the Ware people, um, who were both uh, living based on Kyushu area of Japan, um, but clearly had uh, intensive interactions with the south, south of the Korean peninsula, both in terms of being involved in warfare, um, but also trade and things like that. Um, this, uh, just say quickly, we won't get into it, but this is associated with um, uh, the notion of uh, mimana, the mimana nihonfu, um, which is uh, something noted in early history. Um, and But in 20th century, it was represented by uh, Japanese historians um, as the uh, imagined uh, um, organ of colonial control of Southern Korea in ancient history. Um, this mimana was something historical, but it was not as the Japanese sought to imagine it in the 20th century. Um, however, South Korean pseudo historians, rather than looking at the topic of Mimana based on the critical evidence of um, early sources, um, some archeology, span uh, they simply deny it. They say there's no such thing and that actually the three kingdoms, they rather colonize Japan uh, and there were many three kingdoms, Shilo, Kokoryo, Pekche, uh, were located on modern Japanese islands themselves. So there's very much a rev total revision and denial of the basic uh, facts that we can know about early history. Um, so in coming to the number two here, the, how they practice denialism or forgetting about the 20th century um, and this connects to number two at the top here. So we said um, South Korean pseudo historians today, they associate themselves as being a very patriotic identity as being descended from anti-Japanese independence activists of the early 20th century um, and being very left-wing progressive. That's a self-identifying, we should say. Um, in the process of doing that, they practice, they forget, so they practice some amnesia, uh, they forget um, the actual origins of their ideas of ancient history um, that were very heavily promoted in the 1960s to 1980s, um, particularly 1960s, 1970s, um, by a generation of pseudo historians um, who were actually rather extremely right-wing, anti-left. Anti um, so they have to forget this uh, inconvenient truth of the immediate origins of uh, their own historiography, the ideas they have. So what we've just seen of the, the map of the empire um, and of the old idea of um, uh, proto-civilization in Central Asia. Uh, we may get back to this eventually, uh, or you can ask me in the questions and I can follow up on that a bit more. Um, to move on, uh, and I'll speed up slightly uh, on some of these topics. Uh, so why is this such an issue? In other countries, in maybe every country, certainly in many European countries and in America um, and elsewhere, um, there is, uh, is pseudo-history. Uh, you can find it very often. Um, and so what, why is Korean pseudo history any worse than the kind of crazy ideas um, we often uh, see being promoted by amateur pseudo historians who might write books uh, of uh, aliens and 
things like that, T pyramids built by aliens or pyramids built with the secret of uh, ancient civilization, this kind of pseudo history. Um, it's, it's a problem. It can actually be quite inspiring and very creative as well. It can be very interesting. Um, so what, what makes it so special in Korea? Um, and the answer is that it's causing real damage. Um, it has political influence in Korea. Um, so it causes major obstruction uh, and damage to professional scholarship. And this has been, this goes in cycles um, all the way back to, back, back to this generation of the 1970s um, who promoted similar ideas. Um, but most recently, uh, this has been, uh, we get the example here of um, South Korean pseudo historians. Uh, they engage in government, they lobby the government uh, over various topics concerning such as uh, historical textbook content. So this is a regular uh, topic that comes up that pseudo historians try to influence the content in school textbooks. Because of course, school textbooks, especially in Korea where you have studied very, very hard uh, to pass your high school exams, uh, the content of that um, is very influential in spreading ideas of uh, history. So the pseudo historians would like to have their idea, their conceptualization of ancient Korea, they would like that to be in school textbooks so that every child would learn that there was an ancient empire um, in the past. Um, so these kind of issues, and basically they lobby the, the government very hard. And South Korean government um, is actually quite good at funding scholarship and funding historical research originally. Um, but because of that, uh, if they come under the influence of pseudo historians, uh, then that can have a major impact on the funding. Um, and a very strong example happened uh, now a few years ago, still feels quite recent. Um, so politicians who are themselves, uh, to say it shortly, believers in this pseudo history of ancient Korea, um, politicians who are National Assembly members uh, formed a committee over 2013, 2015 um, against their own government funding organization, uh, the Northeast Asia History Foundation, uh, which is very uh, important and appreciated uh, government foundation uh, supporting scholarship, both nationally and internationally. And Northeast Asia History Foundation was uh, set up around 2005, 2006, um, partly in response to various uh, historical disputes in East Asia, relating both to history uh, and to territory. Um, these have all come under the, the um, portfolio of Northeast Asia History Foundation. Relating to history, uh, this was some um, disputes over the heritage of Kogulio um, that um, occurred between China, mainland China, and South Korea, um, starting, it has a deeper history, but particularly from uh, 2004, this became a major public issue in South Korea, when people became concerned that China was making claims that Kogulio, um, the northern of the three kingdoms, uh, was not Korean, but it was Chinese, and part of the, the imagined multi-ethnic uh, Chinese sphere um, which is the, the historical ideology that uh, Beijing today promotes. Um, so that's the context in which Northeast Asia History Foundation was set up. A lot of money, government money, um, or nation's money from taxpayers, etc., uh, went through this organization into various projects to promote uh, respons critically respons responsibly critical history um, to balance against uh, claims being made by, in this case, China about early history. They also deal with um, issues relating to disputes with Japan, Japanese history, modern history, issues of the memory of the um, sexual slavery and the comfort women, and the disputes over Doctor Island, very many things. Um, the pseudo historians uh, targeted the, Nash the Northeast Asia History Foundation, together with National Assembly members, the so politicians themselves who are believers of uh, pseudo history. So they deployed the anti-establishment colonial historiography polemic, uh, as we just mentioned, 
accusing uh, professional Korean scholars and also international scholars of being pro-Japanese because uh, they present a more uh, critical view of history, like a more accurate um, or more cautious view of history based on the evidence we have, rather than promoting the idea of um, uh, ancient empire. So during this period, 2013 to 2015, the National Assembly formed a committee called the Tongboka Yoksawe Gok Techek Tukpyal Wiwanhe, the Special Committee for Counter Policies Concerning Distortions in Northeast Asian History. And this committee uh, was essentially um, very uh, under the under the influence of the ideas of pseudo historians and they invited some of the leading pseudo historians currently um, as expert witnesses to give their opinion. They also invited um, professional scholars, uh, but to keep the story short, they were less friendly towards the professional scholars rather they were they were kind of questioning them like a kind of uh, inquisition um, along the lines of the accusations made by um, the pseudo historians. This resulted, uh, the special committee hearings resulted in termination of two large uh, flagship projects of the Northeast Asia History Foundation. Um, these two are the early career project, which was based at um, uh, Harvard University, and it was an international project, um, which we'll mention more below, so uh, I'll just say that for now. The early career project um, and a dig digital atlas project, which was uh, domestic, but it was career based um, to produce a digital, I should say historical atlas um, that would be uh, based on the, the latest research uh, that was underway for many years uh, by Korean scholars. Both of these large projects that you see, they ran for many years, um, had their funding terminated, uh, which resulted in the end of these two projects. And this is a great shame, although eventually scholarship will overcome and will continue. Uh, this was a, a really devastating event at the time um, and has set back uh, progress in research on early career, both internationally and nationally inside Korea. So this was a moment when the pseudo historians uh, wielded quite strong political influence. That kind of political influence tends to come in cycles. So there'll be a moment when they're very vigorous, uh, have strong lobbying power, then things will calm down a bit, um, but they never go away entirely. Um, so it's a, it, this is an ongoing issue. Um, this is an illustration of the um, uh, scholars working on the Digital Historical Atlas project. Um, uh, the accusation against them was that these historical maps uh, left off um, Dokdo Island, and therefore these maps were pro-Japanese uh, historical maps. Um, this accusation was actually false uh, because the maps, they're digital maps, and they could generate Dokdo Island if you need to. Um, and it was e even there, but the scale of the maps uh, that they were using were large, so large that Dokdo, being a very, very small island, really only showed up as a kind of a, a dot uh, on the map. Um, and it's irrelevant for ancient history uh, because nothing happened there. Um, but this kind of very, uh, I'd say, um, uh, well, very emotive concern now for national identity uh, was a powerful way to criticize uh, this project. But the, oh, we'll come back to it. Um, yeah, the early career project. So um, to look at this, um, you maybe recognize some of these books. Not all, this is a photo just from my uh, office book, bookshelf just over there, just out of view uh, from my Zoom camera. Um, but this is my holy shelf of um, early career uh, project books. Um, and some other books mixed in here. But you may be familiar with some of these. Hopefully you have uh, copies perhaps in your library. Um, so these large, vol uh, these four large volumes in the red uh, spined volumes here, these were uh, books produced by the Early Career Project. Um, these books, so they were in English, 
as mentioned, the project was based at Harvard University, uh, led by, you see many of these books edited by, not, not all of them, but uh, ed edited by Mark Byington, who was the director of the project um, and other leading scholars. Um, these uh, included chapters authored, some, some authored by international scholars, but the great majority of the chapters could say at least um, probably 90%, if not slightly more, uh, were um, authored by Korean scholars and they were translated into English. Um, so this was not uh, arrogant international scholars writing their version of um, Korean history. This was a project very much trying to uh, introduce Korean language scholarship to make it accessible uh, for international scholars um, through uh, translating the, the um, articles into um, English. Uh, the key concern here, this comes inside, so this volume here, the Hun Commanderies in Early Korean History. So this volume deals with the topic we just mentioned of the, um, the Hun Commanderies that were established uh, in the place of old Chorson uh, following the, the Hun invasion of 108 BCE. So here inside the maps that are taken from uh, this book, we see the location of Lulang. This is the historical uh, location of Lulang. These four maps, they go through different time periods, but you see throughout the yellow one, Lulang, it remains there at Pyongyang. Um, this is what pseudo historians object to. So they say that by containing these kind of maps, uh, the early career project was promoting history uh, that was disadvantageous to South Korea in the history disputes, um, both with uh, Japan, but in the case of Lulang, uh, with China. And this was framed against the ongoing uh, disputes over history of Kogulio uh, with China. Um, so they took this, even though we have uh, historical evidence, uh, texts and archeology, span that support the location of Lulang here. This is some. This is what pseudo historians deny. Um, so they saw that these books were promoting uh, the colonial view of history. Some other examples of um, some of the volumes covering Sam Han period and uh, rediscovery of Kaya in history and archaeology. Um, so this project was terminated, coming to an end in uh, August 2017. So there are this really a, a big hit to international scholarship because it was precisely because it was well funded by the South Korean government. Uh, it was able to do a lot um, to publish these uh, high quality books. This is now uh, turning to the books written by pseudo historians themselves uh, that promoted uh, the colonial that that promoted the accusation of uh, professional historians uh, continuing to practice a colonial view of history. Um, so these two books here we can see, uh, I've added the English here. Um, so uh, this book from 2014, Uli Ane Shingmin Sagwan, The Colonial View of History Within Us. And this one, uh, so this one uh, contained the arguments, there's a chapter here attacking the um, early career project. This book uh, attacks the Digital Atlas project, and it's called Meguke Yoksahak Odikaji Wanna, Traitorous History, How Far Has It Come? So these two books are written by one of the leading, current leading pseudo-historians, um, who I think we're going to see uh, shortly. I'll come back to, um, but the author of those two books. Um, here, if you go in bookstores in Korea, on the display tables, um, there is almost constantly uh, books that promote pseudo-history, books written by pseudo-historians. Uh, this is a new edition of the same book just mentioned, The Colonial View of History Within Us. It's unfortunately so popular, or it has some backing behind it, uh, that it goes into multiple editions and continues to sell. Um, so it continues to promote this um, uh, false allegations against uh, professional scholars, and you get many similar titles. So here's 18 Lies of Traitorous History, Meguk Sahake, Yoyorokati Kotipal. So the author of several of those books, the two main ones we just saw there, um, is uh, this uh, man here, Idokio. So he's been one of the leading voices and writers 
of pseudo history uh, in current years. He's not alone, there's others as well, but certainly uh, he's been uh, the most uh, productive uh, in writing these books. Um, here he is giving uh, his, wit his expert opinion uh, at the um, National Assembly committees uh, during 2014, 2015. This is Edoc Hill. He writes many books. He started as a um, somewhat more moderate uh, popular historian, and his books sold very well. Um, and then at some point, he switched to very much promoting uh, these accusations um, associated with uh, early history. So these, these are more of his books. Um, so among these books, uh, partly this is one of the first where he really turned to interest in early history, so 2006. Um, and this is where this map comes from that we just that we looked at earlier. Um, so it's one example of such maps. Um, so of the old Chorson Empire. So in 2006, Edo Keo published his book, Kojoson um, and Teliuke Jibejayotta. Old Chorson were rulers of the continent. And it contains this uh, fold out map inside. Um, Edoc Hill, incidentally, uh, he has his office, uh, his research center located inside this building. Um, and you can see this building, it's in downtown Seoul, um, quite near to. Uh, my, mind's, my mind's blanking. Um, in Satong, that's it. So it's right next to In Sadong uh, and by An Guk Yok. Um, but the building itself is uh, the headquarters of a new religious organization uh, that's known as the Chondo Kyo religion. Um, and Chondo Kyo is a well established new religion dating to the early 20th century um, and with earlier roots in uh, the Tonghak movement of the starting in the mid 19th century, 1860s. Uh, and then famous for the Tonghak uprising of the 1890s. Um, that movement itself had, um, uh, Tonghak was itself um, a religious movement. Chondokyo was the reinvention or the second generation of that religion in the early 20th century. Um, so uh, this connection is, uh, it doesn't need to be overemphasized, um, but it's uh, notable that Edokyo uh, has his offices inside uh, the central headquarters of the Chondokyo uh, religion. Um, and you can go inside, um, but as, this, uh, as we're being recorded on this lecture, I'm not going to uh, show what happens quite inside here. But if you ask in the questions later, I will uh, tell you more. Um, but his center is called the Hangalam Yoksa Munwa Yongusso Idokyo, uh, is busy writing his books inside here. Um, so that's one strand. Uh, and we see now where that map of the ancient empire comes from. Um, coming back now to this map that we'd looked at is kind of the other, another major aspect of conceptualization of pseudo history of Huan Guk. Um, so to remind you of this uh, proto uh, civilization, this comes in, as we see printed in the book, this, uh, these photos I've just photographed in the book. And if we zoom out, then we see a broader, um, the arrows going in all directions. This book is the Huandang Kogi, uh, is the title of the book. Um, and this is the edition of the book uh, from which those maps are found. Um, this version was printed, was first uh, released in 2012. The Huandang Kogi is a text uh, that pseudo historians claim to be an authentic history. Uh, that that provides the details and the history of the super ancient periods we looked at of Huan Guk and Pedal, uh, and then continuing through Korean history. This version, uh, quite colorful on the front cover, uh, you find everywhere in Korean bookstores. It's, it's distributed um, many places in the major bookstores and also in the minor bookstores, in the airport, um, in Incheon, uh, K, I can't remember the name of the bookstore there, K Books, I think it's called. Uh, you can pick up this copy of Huan Dan Kogi. So this version uh, was published in 2012 and it's um, annotated, translated and annotated by someone called An Gyeong John. Uh, and we'll, we'll come back to that. 
Huandan Kogi, um, because it's treated by pseudo historians as an authentic text, there are multiple versions of people who have translated Huandan Kogi. And the original version or original language from which they translate it is literary Chinese or similar to classical Chinese. So they understand that this was a text that was passed down through history. Um, so recognizing that early texts, especially pre 20th century historical texts um, were written in Chinese. Uh, this text was forged. Uh, it was uh, created anew um, in classical ch literary Chinese to make it authentic. Um, and then they translated into other languages. This process of um, the creation of the Huandang Koki um, has been proven uh, to have occurred during the 1970s um, by someone called E.U. Lib. Um, and basically we know this because E.U. Lib published early versions of sections of the Huandang Koki uh, in several magazines uh, that at the time it was the, um, the magazine that was kind of the, um, the collective place uh, for, the, for that generation of pseudo historians uh, to publish their ideas. So we see early versions, kind of early drafts with slight variations and things um, being published and changed uh, in magazines in the 1970s, uh, published by EU Lip. Then in 1979, the first official version came out. Interestingly, um, translated by a Japanese, um, uh, I have to say pseudo historian again, but there's probably more nuanced ways to describe these people. Um, but anyway, the first kind of ironically, uh, the first full translation uh, was in Japanese. Um, so I think they call it Kandan Koki, maybe um, 1979. The, there's in between this, there's actually an, at least one other early Korean translation. Um, but the most influential translation into Korean is the 1986 edition by this person, Im Sung Guk. Um, it's, been rel it's relatively certain that Im Sung Guk did not translate from the original classical Chinese, but rather he translated the Japanese of um, Kashima Nobolu's uh, version. And they know that because uh, the syntax he uses, the, the um, uh, sentence structure that he takes, the punctuation basically, is the same as the Japanese edition, and that was added by um, Kashima. Um, also, the annotations it includes, the notes, uh, they're very similar to those of Kashima. Um, so it's most likely uh, that this was uh, translated from the Japanese. This has been the most, uh, as I say, influential version, and it's still found in bookstores uh, today until we get to the 2012 edition um, by An Gyeong John. Um, and this edition by An Gyeong John, I don't go into so much detail in this presentation, but it has a very large introduction uh, where it's, it's very much uh, supplemented uh, with many maps and explanations, including those maps uh, I just shown you. So this edition, the 2012 edition of Huan Dan Kogi, so we noted it's uh, translated and annotated and annotated by An Gyeong John. This is An Gyeong John, and who is An Gyeong John? He is the second generation patriarch of the new religion of Jung Sang Do that was established in 1974, and it's very much through this person An Gyeong John uh, that we get um, this as mentioned at the begin, be, beginning, the um, meeting of new religion, um, specifically this Jung Sang Do uh, new religion um, and the promotion of pseudo history. So here's An Gyeong John. And here he is again on um, the TV station uh, that is owned by the Jung Sang Do religion, uh, which is uh, we see here STB. If you're in uh, traveling in Korea and you tune in on local uh, TVs and hotel rooms or um, such, uh, you can often find STB TV channel is often available. Uh, it stands for Sang Sang Pang Song. Um, 
there is also so this is Sang Sang Broadcasting, the TV station. There's also Sang Sang Publishing, and that's what published uh, the Huan Dan Koki and many other books promoting pseudo history. Um, so An Gyeong John, he's the head of this religious organization, um, and he, together with others, uh, both promotes the religion of Jung Sang Do uh, and also promotes Huan Dan Koki. So now, just quickly, a detour to um, just uh, highlight uh, some details of the Jung Sang Do religion. And think of this um, initially as something separate to pseudo history. Um, it has its own tradition. Uh, it's an authentic religious tradition that emerged that can be traced back to certainly through the 19th century and with um, influences, we can kind of trace the origins uh, back a little bit more. But it was as in its current form, uh, Jung Sang Do, as we saw, it was established by An Gyeong John's father in 1974, but it takes its name from a slightly deeper tradition of the early 20th century. Anyway, Jung Sang Do today, um, so if you practice Jung Sang Do, you tune into their TV stations or watch them on YouTube, uh, you will learn about this message of autumn kebyok. Um, this is a millenarian message, meaning it's the idea of a great transition uh, in cosmic time and the world we're living in. Um, and this uh, transition, uh, so a transition from our current uh, period, the epoch in which we live, uh, there'll be some kind of uh, rather apocalyptic, disastrous moment uh, that can go on for many, many years. Um, but that, that is a, a transition into um, a new golden age. So it also, it preaches the idea of uh, apocalypse, a kind of end of the world, um, but not total end of the world. If you survive um, by practicing this religion, then you can survive into the golden age. So this is kind of a millenarian message. According to Jung Sang Do, uh, the autumn kebyok uh, represents a transition between um, cosmic seasons of time uh, and the total uh, cycle um, lasts 129,600 years. So we, these enormous cycles of time. Uh, and within these cycles, uh, we go through cosmic spring, summer, autumn, winter. Um, cosmic summer uh, is the golden age of Huan Guk. Um, now we're, in the, we're beginning and heading into the apocalypse um, the, of autumn, Kerbyok. Kerbyok here represents the transition. It, can, it literally means something like an opening um, uh, or sometimes translated as creation. Um, but in this sense, it refers to the upheaval, the transition. And then the cosmic autumn will be uh, a new kind of golden age. So we're currently living in this transition. Kerbyok is characterized, or Jung Sang Do, they characterize Kerbyok as um, uh, involving both political and climactic upheavals. Um, on this side, uh, they can very much have the, the feeling of a doomsday cult because they're, they're talking about the end of the world as we know it. Um, and so they use any example they can of uh, the current, what well, difficult age in which we live. Um, so this is not to deny that um, we live with climate crisis, et cetera, and we see uh, many po political problems around the world. Um, so they take these as evidence of the Kerbyok uh, transition being underway. Most lately, if you check their videos, they're now taking the, um, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, as further evidence of um, the, uh, the, that we're entering or that we're getting to the, the deep side of um, Kerbyok. However, if you survive this uh, minor apocalypse, then uh, we're followed by the golden age of autumn harvest. Um, the autumn, as they describe it, the, it's an autumn harvest of humanity. So we are the fruit of the autumn. Um, and this will bring world peace, uh, which would be a nice thing, certainly. Um, and this world peace will begin with unification of the Korean peninsula of North and South. And with, with, within Chung Sang Do, uh, they, they zoom in and out of uh, scales of focus with a career centric aspect to it. So of course the division of the Korean peninsula is most 
relevant to Koreans, and this religion has evolved uh, in a Korean context. Uh, this is how they often illustrate um, Kebyok. Uh, they say that um, the, the axis of the world uh, is going to shift during Kebyok, um, and they use concepts of former heaven, in, we're in former heaven now, and later heaven, um, so son, son chan and hu chan. So former heaven, uh, the axis is this way, so it's a bit wonky. Um, and with transition, uh, it will write itself to being a nice straight axis that will bring world peace. Um, as you'll see, they use a lot of symbolism, the Chinese symbols, etc. Uh, they're not inventing everything. They're borrowing a lot from pre-existing traditions, uh, going right back to uh, ancient um, Chinese sources, such as the Book of Changes, um, that was very much used for predicting the future, prognostication, these kind of things. So the shifting axis, uh, and with their very nice uh, um, animation CGI uh, that they use a lot of on their channel, so we see this illustrated, the axis of the Earth uh, is going to um, correct itself for autumn, cosmic autumn. And this is Sang Sang, which gives the name to their TV station. So the aim of Chung Sang Do believers is to prepare for Kebyok. Daily practice, forget about pseudo history briefly, um, if you're just a normal, well, until recently, if you were just a normal Chung Sang Do practitioner, your main concerns are traditional uh, Chung Sang practice uh, that involves chanting of prayer texts, um, the most famous one being, or the most important one being called the Tail Jul, um, and something they call dynamic meditation, Pogong. Um, and this involves a uh, um, most visually, it involves a kind of bobbing of the body when you're meditating. So it's like a dancing form of meditation. And early version or early 20th century descriptions of the religious practices uh, on from which Jung Sang Do has evolved, uh, some of them in uh, actually describe it as the dancing religion. Um, so I think this is uh, uh, how it's been translated, like this uh, idea of this dynamic uh, meditation. This partly comes from. Uh, this uh, form, it was seen as rather than meditating, uh, for example, as we imagine uh, Buddhist son meditation very still, uh, it's something dynamic where you, you dance a bit, you uh, bounce your body. Through chanting and meditation, practitioners are able to channel the life force of the universe, enabling them to survive the Kebyok transition. So this is the ideal. Um, Further detour, just to look at Jung Sang Do very briefly. Um, so the name, the Jung San of Jung Sang Do, and the Do means way, uh, which kind of gives it the, the sense of being a practice or a religion. Uh, the Jung San comes from the name of a historical personage uh, who um, was a esoteric leader. So he was a, he claimed to be um, uh, the reincarnation of God, basically. Um, bringing the message of Kebyok to the world. So this person is Kang Il Sun. Jung San is his style name. So Jung San Kang Il Sun. Um, and we see his dates here. So turn of the 20th century. Um, he actually lived through, uh, for example, the Tonghak uprising of the 1890s. I think he wasn't directly involved, but um, uh, part of kind of the broader similar milieu. Um, and he died relatively early, just before the Japanese uh, annexation um, of 1910. So he died in 1907. So the Jung Sang religions, and many came following his death, uh, then several competitive religions uh, grew out of kind of the belief of Jung Sang's uh, prophecies of himself being a messiah, um, a god come to earth to save the people with the message of Kebyok and teach them how to save themselves through these spells and through the method of dynamic meditation, these kind of things. So there's a real historical uh, origin of the religion and a, and a or very much an authentic tradition, an authentic religious tradition, um, which is uh, interesting in its own right. Um, today, this is the uh, official portrait of the god of Jung Sang Do. Um, uh, and of the Jung Sang religions, but this is the portrait that's been created for Jung Sang Do, uh, the current day religion that we're looking at. So they refer to their god as Sang Jenim, 
uh, meaning high emperor uh, with the nim, the honorific. Um, and just very briefly, this uh, is very illustrative of how these kind of religions bring together um, an East Asian aspect of the broader um, Sinic uh, or Chinese or East Asian cultural sphere. Um, so here we have uh, the usage of uh, Sangjie, which is a traditional term uh, in early Chinese texts for some kind of upper being, the ultimate kind of god. Um, and then they match that with the Korean honorific Nim. Uh, so we get Sangjie Nim. And very much this, these traditions uh, uh, syncretize um, these broader East Asian traditions uh, together with kind of local, very local specifics of Korea, and then even local regional specifics. Uh, this god, uh, they claim, corresponds to the Confucian High Emperor that was Sangje. Very importantly, the Maitreya Buddha, the future Buddha, Milukbu the Jade Emperor of Taoism, and the Christian god Hananim, which by the 19th century, Catholicism obviously entering Korea from the late 18th century, um, which partly influenced the development of um, this Tonghak religion, for example, in the mid 19th century. Um, but then you've got a Protestant Christianity uh, very much spreading from the 1880s. Um, and I, if I get this right, I think Hananim as a term for the Christian God uh, is associated with Protestant practice. Um, so they claim that all of these uh, uh, high beings or gods um, are actually one God, um, and that is the God that in Jung, that Jung Sang Do worships. Um, I said about Maitreya Buddhism that that's very important because I think overall the Jung Sang religions they demonstrate most influence from, or a continuity of tradition from Maitreya Buddhism. And Maitreya Buddhism, the Maitreya Buddha is the future Buddha and a major component of uh, worshiping or practicing belief in Maitreya Buddha um, is belief in a future age, the Maitreya who's currently waiting in uh, Tosolchon, uh, Tushita heaven, uh, will come down to earth and create a new age. So it's one of the sources for this cyclical uh, view. I mean, Buddhism is one of these sources for the cyclical view of changing epochs. So Maitreya Buddhism has a very strong millenarian aspect to it. Uh, that's probably the strongest direct influence on Chung Sang Do millenarianism. Uh, these are the modern portraits. So um, the, the god Jung Sang uh, and the um, goddess Temonim, uh, and she is based on the historical wife of uh, Jung Sang Gang Yil Sun uh, called Kuo Palier. So they uh, worship a couple, um, which is an innovation to Jung Sang Do specifically. So meditative practice looks like this in Jung Sang Do. Um, we see they uh, meditate in front, they practice, uh, they chant their spells and they meditate in front of portraits of their gods. Um, here we have uh, Jung Sang, uh, Temonim, the great uh, mother. Here we have a, a photograph portrait of um, the, founder, the founder of Jung Sang Do, An Un San, who is, was the father of An Gyeong John. Um, so in the largest halls where they can have many portraits, they include a photo of the, the um, historical founder. Um, and then who's this on the left side? They have a portrait of Tangun, who is the traditional, um, demi uh, originally in the mythology, he's um, a, uh, a demigod. Uh, so he's born um, complicated birth actually to um, uh, Huanung who has come down from the sky and to a bear who has changed into a woman. Um, in the early 20th century, there was another new religion that uh, based itself on worshipping uh, Tangun. That new religion came under the name, originally it was called Tangun Gyo, so it was the religion, the teaching of Tangun. Um, but in the early 20th centuries, it was renamed as Tejong Gyo. Tejong Gyo is now a parallel, it's a different, basically it's a different new religion that's also active. Um, but less active than Jung Sang Do. And Jung Sang Do 
has included Tangun uh, into their pantheon. And Tangun, if you know from your mythology of Korea, Tangun is associated as the, with the foundation myth of old Choson, as recorded in the Samguk Yusa. Um, so this starts to link now um, uh, Chung Sang Do with ideas of history of old Choson. Before the current form of Chung Sang Do, so if we, early 20th century Chung San, uh, as far as I know, it wasn't interested in Tangun. Uh, it was doing its own thing uh, with the with uh, the god, the Sang Jenim god, uh, and worship of Jung Sang as the Messiah, as the Messiah who had recently come. So inclusion of Tangun, something uh, more recent. So under An Gyeong John, that is the the second generation leader of Chung Sang Do, who came into kind of he worked with his father already, but from the two thousands, An Gyeong John, after a battle with his brothers over control of the religion. Uh, and Gyeong John came out in control. So under his influence, current day Chung Sang Do additionally teaches about Kebyok, um, among many additional things, but we'll just focus on this bit. Um, the knowledge to survive Kebyok is encoded in the ancient religious philosophy of ancient Korean civilization. This was termed Shin Gyo, divine teaching, literally Shin Gyo. Um, the key source for knowledge on ancient Shingyo is Huandang Koki. So this now connects the Huandang Koki, brings it into Jung Sang Do, the, and it's conveniently published by Sang Seng, um, which is the media wing of Jung Sang Do. Um, so they teach that to read and recite Huandang Koki in the context of uh, Jung Sang Do practitioners becomes almost a religious act in itself. Um, and so they can achieve some salvation uh, through the meaning survival being, being in a religious sense, set, sense being saved, um, survival from Kebyok uh, through reading, gaining knowledge of ancient history and the supposed ancient wisdom of Shingyo that was practiced in Huanguk period and that was transmitted to the present in this book, Huan Dang Kogi, that the jet, that the patriarch of Jung Sang Do, Ang Yong John, has taken the time to retranslate and annotate and sell back to you. Um, so this is you can buy his book. Uh, Jung Sang Do headquarters are sorry, keep clicking too quickly. Jung Sang Do headquarters are located in Taejeon, um, and this is the so the the city south of south of Seoul very central South Korea. Um, and this is the Jung Sang Do uh, headquarters, headquarters of the STB broadcasting TV station. Um, and they have very large space in here where they hold uh, religious events. If you walk inside this building, uh, there's this large foyer, the entrance hall, and hanging from the second floor is this huge banner, um, which now will be familiar to you because it's the map of Hwanguk. It says here, Hwangukeso Podonagan Pongsoe Sege Munmyong, the global civilizations that have spread out east and, east and west from Hwanguk. Um, so we see the promotion of the map um, together with here the, um, the same periodization scheme, the timeline that we looked at at the beginning of the presentation. Um, here, just the Korean section. Um, so Hwanguk, Pedal, Chos Old Choson. Uh, and then continuing Koryo Dynasty, Choson Dynasty, South Korea, North Korea. Um, so in the main religious headquarters, the center of also the TV station, we see very strong promotion of the, of the, the um, view of ancient history as well. Uh, so that's the same map as found in the book. This is the introductory part of uh, the Huandang Koki, the colorful edition we've looked at. Um, this was just a recent video put up by uh, ST on the um, uh, Sang Seng Pang Song YouTube channel um, showing home practice of a, um, a family of believers. Um, and this is uh, very indicative of, the, of how they brought these together now. So we see um, uh, 
the main altar. So this is at home in the in the in a normal apartment of Chung Sang Do practitioners. So practitioners maintain their own altar. So we see the portraits. There's Anun San, the father, and Gyeong John, uh, the son and current patriarch. Um, and they have a, a ritual water, a kind of holy water um, here. But then on the other wall, uh, just notice casually placed. Um, and of course, this may be a setup. This may just be, um, uh, it may not be an authentic uh, room in an apartment, but it's, uh, we don't know because it's the um, uh, TV station. Uh, but they have the educational map uh, on the wall here. So really now they now maintain, they brought these both together basically. In the family practicing. And this was called a home practice they were talking about. So Sang Jenim Kwane Cho Sang O Hamke Moshin, Guchon Yon Shin Gyolu, Kiesung Han, Yol Meshing Gyo, Meguk Tedo, Chung Sang Doe, Shinang Ye Pop. Um so that's a mouthful, I'm not gonna be able to translate it all in one go. Um but key points here is it's saying that like um uh the the um way of practicing Jung Sang Do belief at home um uh that Su uh, succeeds, continues um, 9,000 years of Shingyo, so that's the name of the divine knowledge to survive Kerbyok, um, that has been maintained together with our ancestors um, and Sangjenim, the god. So Sangjenim, the god, and our ancestors for 9,000 years, uh, we've transmitted and maintained the knowledge of Shingyo through this kind of practice um, of, the, of the more traditional side of Jung Sang practice. In the bookstore, uh, we have, um, so this is the bookstore that is attached to the headquarters that we just saw in Taejeon there, in the main Jung Sang Do building, they have a bookstore. Um, and in the bookstore, uh, no surprise, you can find Huan Dan Kogi. Uh, there's different sized editions. So if you see in the, in the bottom right, that's the version that I've been showing so far in the presentation, because that's the one I can afford. Um, there's the, there's the um, extra size one, uh, which you also see in bookstores, very expensive. Um, it's mainly, the, it's the same content, uh, but with a few more pictures and larger font, um, but it's basically the same, uh, and a few extra annotations and things, um, but otherwise it's the same. You also get a very short version, which is like the digest edition, uh, where it's just the introduction of this book uh, without any of the content, just the maps uh, and Ang Kyung John's introduction. Uh, other books relating to uh, pseudo history, essentially, but talking about early history. Um, and then other books are more related to, actually, mostly is related to history. But other books here are related to Jung Sang religious practice. This pink and blue books, this is Kerbyok. Uh, these have a big explanation of um, uh, the Kerbyok uh, apocalypse uh, to come. In other bookstores, so this is now commercial bookstores, uh, not run by Jung Sang Do. Uh, the two, one, one of the largest chains, Yongpeng, uh, Yongpeng Mungo, Yongpeng Bookstore in downtown Seoul. If you go to the early Korea section, early Korean history sections in these bookstores, uh, you will find the Hwan Dan Kogi, actually several, Hwan Dan Kogi, Hwan Dan Kogi, Hwan Dan Kogi. It's a different edition, three different editions of Hwan Dan Kogi. That's the Im Sung Guk's version. That's the um, Ang Kyung John's version. So these are just placed uh, in the early Korean history section as if they're authentic history. Um, and a, a, a problem uh, is that many of the books on the shelves under the early Korean history section are frankly pseudo history. A rather worrying, even the majority of the books in this photograph um, are pseudo history, the great majority uh, seen here with some some good history, critical history uh, in between, but very little, which means um, if you don't know too much about the topic, but you just have a genuine interest in Korean history as a Korean or as a foreigner, um, and you go into the bookstore and you hope to find books that will educate you about the past, um, you almost have no choice but to end up reading pseudo history. And of course, there's no warning on these books. There's nothing to tell you this one is pseudo history, this one isn't. Um, and because there's so many of them, 
uh, it's so it's very basically influential. People end up reading them. The books are very attractive. They draw you in with exciting claims, very colorful, very nicely designed. Um, so this is why it's a, it's a problem. And then this influences popular opinion. Uh, also politicians, and National Assembly people, if they want to go and buy a book on history, uh, they'll come into the bookstore uh, and the chances are um, they will pick up a book that is pseudo history. They might even pick up the Huan Dan Kogi. Um, and because it's in every book, you start to wonder, like maybe I should read this book because every time I go in the bookstore, there it is. Uh, K Books, this is at Incheon International Airport. Um, they have the Huan Dan Kogi on display here. And I have to admit, this is actually how I bought my own copy because uh, I've been too embarrassed to buy it in the main bookstores. Uh, but when I was leaving Korea a few years back, um, because it was there in the airport, um, that was when I finally uh, took took the jump, took the leap, uh, and bought this edition of Huan Dan Koki. Um, I actually I already had one copy before. Here is An Gyeong John on the right in 2015, uh, handing over copies of his works, most chiefly the Huan Dan Koki, Huan Dan Koki, um, to North Koreans. Um, so we see direct transition. Oh, sorry, what's the word? Direct uh, transferal of uh, the, these kind of books to North Korea. Of course, this doesn't happen every day, um, but uh, through these such cases as this, um, they are passing on uh, the books even to North Korea. And the North Koreans, that a whole other topic is North Korean um, pseudo history. North Koreans have been aware of Hwan Dan Kogi for a long time already. Um, to my knowledge, I can't say too much about it because I don't know, but to my knowledge, they don't, they don't actively promote it or believe it, but occasionally they make use of it if it's in very specific circumstances. Uh, but most importantly, they're aware of it, um, as they are quite aware of many things in South Korea, South Korean scholarship. This last section, I'll share my screen in a second, um, but I'll try to talk just briefly about the, some of the, the historical um, context of pseudo history um, to show how we can historicize uh, pseudo history. That means to place their ideas in historical context. Um, so their ideas of ancient history, they believe that that is actual ancient history, such as the, the Manchurian Empire. Um, briefly, I will try to show how we can expose um, the, the falsity of that thinking, and we can show more modern origins uh, of their ideas. So um, I'll share the screen. Okay, can you see the presentation okay? Great. Um, so, as mentioned at the beginning, pseudo historians, they make a claim that their lineage of historiography, um, A, that their ideas are true, um, but they trace their lineage to um, anti-Japanese independence activists of the early 20th century and of the colonial period. Um, the two big names um, that they trace back to are, are Shin Che Ho and Kim Kyo Hon. Um, among these, Shin Che Ho is uh, very famous. You may have come across him uh, in other contexts. And both these, uh, let's call them historian activists, uh, it's true that they did, um, between them, uh, author kind of the first version of this idea of a uh, of um, the Manchurian Empire and also ideas of central uh, or even deeper origins in Central Asia. Um, the context in which they were working in the early 20th century was against the context of the um, uh, Japanese taking control and ultimately the, the annexation of Korea to Japan. Um, 
while being anti-Japanese uh, in that sense, they were nevertheless uh, influenced by uh, the milieu of ideas at the time, um, including this interest in Manchuria, um, and which the Japanese had themselves, such that they invaded Korea and then they invaded Manchuria and established the puppet state of Manchukuo. Um, so uh, they also had an interest in um, uh, the Japanese assets. They had interest in tracing origins to Central Asia. So these ideas were not limited to one side of the battle for Korean independence, if you will. Um, they both, it triggered uh, interest in Manchuria on both sides. Similarly, on the new religion front, um, so we mentioned uh, that briefly Tangun becoming the subject of a new religion, this Tangun Gyo that became Taejong Gyo um, in late 19th century, early 20th century. Kim Gyo Hon, who authored uh, history as well, he was a Taejong Gyo activist and he became uh, one of the leaders of the Taejong Gyo movement. Um, so he's very kind of representative of the early in the early meeting of new religion and uh, pseudo history, um, although that was in the context of Taejong Gyo, separate to Jung Sang Do. Uh, just the point I wanted to make on that was that even these religions, these uh, Taejong Gyo being very uh, nation, positively nationalistic uh, in the context of uh, being colonized by Japan, so trying to reinvigorate the belief and memory of Tangun. Um, but at the same time, the Japanese were also interested in Tangun, and Tangun, for example, was treated as a um, deity within Shinto. Um, and so again, many of the ideas, they're found on both sides of the, of the divide between uh, being participant in Japanese empire and being uh, activists against it, independence fighters or independence activists. And Shin Che Ho turned, became, after writing history, he, he became more um, of an activist and ultimately died uh, in prison, uh, imprisoned by the Japanese. Um, but just so to note that that is true, or to note that there is this early influence, um, but we're going to discuss more, we're going to historicize um, the space in between. So pseudo historians, they would claim their lineage directly back to Shin Che Ho and Kim Gyo Hon, but they ignore uh, the influence that came from the Japanese empire and how that uh, influence was adopted by the in-between generation, the intermediate generation of promoters of pseudo history. Um, this is the generation I mentioned who were very active in the 1970s, including uh, the case of uh, EU Lip uh, forging the Huan Dan Kogi. Um, this slide is basically saying a bit of uh, we should contextualize uh, 20th century uh, Korean pseudo history um, so that we can understand it as a phenomenon. This provides a method to debunk claims by pseudo historians about the origins. Um, of their tradition. So those origins being uh, tracing to Shin Che Ho and Kim Kyo Hon, um, also debunking their claims of that it's true history that there actually was an ancient uh, empire. Also, we can recognize this as an interesting socio-historical phenomenon in its own right. Um, and so from the side of uh, history of ideas, history of history, um, it's we should investigate how the conceptualization of pseudo historians has uh, evolved and it's interesting to trace back uh, as a history of ideas. Um, so jumping perhaps slightly surprisingly um, to a book uh, which I could very strongly recommend uh, in the context of modern Korean history, not, not related to pseudo history mainly, uh, Ku Hagen's Korean Workers, um, a history of uh, labor activism in South Korea um, of re recent uh, late 20th century or mid, mid to late 20th century. Um, but in here, uh, a paragraph jumps, jumped out at me not long ago, um, talking about the 1990s um, and Ku Hagen in this book, he's talking about the labor movement, nothing to, until now, nothing to do with pseudo history, um, talking about the very uh, 
important modern history of uh, labor activism and fight for labor rights uh, in Korea. Um, against the context of the labor movement in the 1990s, we can't get into details of that, um, but just let's uh, read this uh, paragraph because it's very interesting. So in the 1990s, so he's talking about how the, the state, the South Korean government tried to defuse and distract the workers from organizing for labor rights. Um, so the state, the South Korean state also played an important role in the new campaign through Tamil ideology, which appeared in the 1990s and was used frequently in the ideological education of workers. This was um, so spread in uh, teachings in factories and things, including in official labor unions um, and also in the more kind of activist labor unions. So what is this Tamil ideology? This relatively new ideology, really means of the 20th century, supposedly derived from the ideas of Tangan, the mysterious founder of the Korean people. It was strongly nationalistic and chauvinistic. Tamil ideology reminded Koreans of the much larger territory that the ancient Koreans had occupied, including much of the Manchu area and of the splendid culture their forefathers had developed. So that's, we know what that is because we've seen the map of the um, much larger area of Manchuria. Tamil ideologues insisted that the Korean people try to restore the grandeur of their history and culture. In order to do this, workers needed to understand the precarious position of their nation and economy occupied in the ever competitive and hostile international system and get out of the small discontents of human rights and labor rights, the small discontents, small anger, and small sorrows, and have pride in being the principal agent of rebuilding Korea's history. Tamil educational programs skillfully combined lectures with traditional music, art, and martial art classes. Many companies enrolled their workers in these programs with apparently very satisfactory results. So this paragraph is very interesting from the position of uh, interest in pseudo history, 20th century, um, the history of pseudo history. Um, and so it tells us how the ideas of pseudo history that we've been examining already, uh, how they were promoted through government programs uh, and, lo and business factory programs uh, promoted among the people the laborers to distract them from politics, essentially, to distract them from the labor movement uh, in South Korea and to make them desire a great country, to make them feel angry that they've lost their land, um, to want to imagine, aspire to reclaiming that Manchuria empire that they believed was um, uh, ancient Korean territory. Notably, this generation of um, workers in the 1990s, or well, actually they would have been slightly younger, but around this time, uh, I wanted to, across the night, particularly the 1980s more, but then in this case, continuing into the 1990s, the promotion of the pseudo history was very influential on uh, the young adult generation, student generation and adult generation. This generation very broadly um, is sometimes known politically as the 386 generation. He might've come across this term in South Korean politics today. The 386 generation, the six working backwards, are those born in the 1960s uh, who were in their, um, in the 1980s, they were in their 30s. That's the 863, 386. Um, this generation of students in the 1980s, uh, this was the first generation to be exposed to Hwan Dan Kogi, for example, and Hwan Dan Kogi became very popular among students. Um, and then we see how it continues in this example from Kuhagen in the 1990s. Um, and this generation uh, is now at the height of their political powers because they're aged in their, pretty much in their 50s, late 50s and 60s now. Um, e. Doc Hill, the, um, exam the, the person we saw who's very active authoring, promoting pseudo history, he was born in 1961. And actually, uh, not all of them, but a considerable number of the most influential pseudo historians 
the National Assembly men who believe in the pseudo history, they are very much of this same generation. Um, and they are the generation, not the whole generation, uh, but those uh, within them, they identify as being also kind of left wing progressive, associate themselves uh, with the student movements of the, uh, the student movements and the labor movements of the 1980s and 1990s. So we see how pseudo history in this case of the uh, labor movement uh, was used to influence people and to distract um, them from uh, current issues. So similar to 1990s Tamil movement, empire advocates today would argue that the continuity between their imagined ancient empire of old Chorson and the early state of uh, Kogolio. Uh, okay, so this is something I'm going to show as well. Um, this is better explained with maps. According to this narrative, Kogolio was a territorial restoration of old Chorson, and the same territory should be reclaimed today. Um, this will become... Uh, should be visible with maps in a moment. Uh, Kogolio being the northern most of the three kingdoms of early Korean history, you're probably familiar with Kogolio. Um, Kogolio, at the height of its uh, territorial expansion, uh, was covered um, most of southern Manchuria um, and then into the Korean Peninsula as well. Um, that was in the fifth century under King Kwang Geto and then uh, under his son, uh, Jiang Su Wang, uh, King Jiang Su. Um, so they take the image of Kogolio, here we go, um, and then they use, they borrow the idea of the Kogolio expansive uh, territory and say that this was Kogolio reclaiming the ancient territory of old Chorson. Um, here are two maps by Edokio from two books, one being the old Chorson map, uh, and then on the right, uh, we see the map of Kogulio, according to Edok Hill, um, in the fifth century. Uh, so we see at the bottom of the map, there's actually the three kingdoms, Pekche, Kaya, Shilla, the, the fourth of the three kingdoms. Uh, and then Kogulio looking absolutely massive here. Um, this is uh, quite an exaggeration um, of Kogulio's territory. If you just trust my mouth, my, if you follow my mouse, um, at the height of its territory, it was more like uh, this much to the north, I think is safe to say. Um, but Edokil wants to imagine all of this territory. Um, more important is that you see the maps are basically identical. Um, so they trace back, they say that Kogolio was a restoration, reclaiming the territory of old Chorson. And what they hint at is that we should do the same today. Like ultimately, this is our lost land. The ultimate logic uh, of talk, imagining this ancient territory is to say that that's lost land that we should take back at some point. Um, obviously, that's at the moment, that's not very realistic uh, because the Korean Peninsula is divided um, and China is very strong at the moment. Um, but still, that's kind of the, the ultimate logic and the dream would be to reclaim this territory. Uh, so they say that Kogolio was a restoration of the old Chorson uh, territory. Uh, here's the more realistic map uh, from the, um, uh, uh, it's a map from one of the early career project uh, books. So we see here more realistic representation based on uh, critical scholarship and archeology span of the territory of Kogolio. Um, to show, to demonstrate how much Edok Hill has exaggerated, uh, here are these two maps. I've tried to make them roughly at the same uh, absolute scale to one another. So um, this is the, what we just saw representing critical scholarship, if you will, so the good scholarship based on textual and archeological evidence. And I think I tried to make the scale roughly the same size. Um, so the shape, the size of the peninsula is pretty much the same. So we can see if we can compare them, we can see just how massively exaggerated uh, Edok Hill's idea of Kogulio territory in the fifth century CE is. And then now we can do the same with Old Chorson as well. So Old Chorson, uh, we've seen that we've seen Edok Hill, and he's not alone among pseudo historians, just very representative. Uh, Edok Hill's map of Old Chorson, uh, we've just been looking at many times. 
there certainly was a historical state of old Chorson, um, but its actual territory, um, based on uh, more critical scholarship, this map I should say is taken from uh, Mark Byington's monograph on Puyo history, um, I forget the exact title now, um, uh, published in 2016. Um, this map, so he's showing old Chorson here, um, and we know that it ended up with its capital at Pyongyang. This is the Korean Peninsula would be here. So Old Choson uh, is a very interesting ancient state um, about which we have quite limited knowledge, to be honest. Um, but based on what we know and what kind of archaeology is realistic, uh, it was likely a state um, based on this area. If we compare that to E. Doc Hill's map, uh, we can see again the, the incredible exaggeration um, the fantasy of old Chorson territory. Um, so essentially pseudo historians, this is wishful thinking. There's no real, they, they do provide some kind of uh, evidence, but it's not good evidence uh, if you analyze it. Um, it's very poor evidence. Um, so we can see this again is at scale. So uh, historical old Chorson, we could be reasonable and say it occupied this kind of space. And at a time, for a time, it was very important state in its own right. Um, but oh, uh, we see the exaggeration under Edoc Hill. We can trace back pseudo historians. So this is going back to an example of pseudo history uh, from 1969, Munjong Chang. So this is one of the generation of the intermediate pseudo historians. Um, uh, there, his representation here of uh, old Chorson and of Kogulio. Um, actually, his Kogulio map is more reasonable, so um, uh, that's kind of okay. So let's focus on the old Chorson one. So the old Chorson map, you will see it's the same as Edoc Hill's map. Um, and this is working backwards in time. So we can understand that Edoc Hill's ideas of the territory of old Chorson uh, come from earlier versions of the same thing promoted by pseudo historians. To be fair, Shin Che Ho, um, the, uh, the early 20th century activist historian we just brought up, uh, he describes a similar territory um, for old Chorson, but there's a, we can expand on uh, his imagination. Hold on. So here's E. Dokil and Munjong Chang. We can see they're basically identical maps. What this map is most immediately uh, similar to um, is the puppet state of Manchukuo uh, established by the Japanese in, hope I get the year right, 1932, around then. Um, so this was the idea, an interest in Manchuria that had developed in the 20th century under the context of Japanese imperialism. Um, and Japanese imperialism had, of course, grown from the late 19th century, um, had then uh, entered Korea with Japanese ambitions first to take hold of Korea uh, and then spread to um, the state where they expanded and ultimately invaded both Manchuria and then China. And they established the state of Manchukuo. And you see the borders. Um, they're partly identical because it's based on rivers. Um, so these were... Um, uh, obvious geographical uh, frontiers to make, and you've got Russia on the other side, so actually you can't expand any further. Um, but the, the border of old Chorson, uh, if we imagine this is dated to any time before 108 BCE, uh, there's no Russia at that time. Uh, so this, this uh, modern international border is completely ahistorical, uh, but it's very clearly based on, is based on the modern historical border uh, of Manchuria, um, especially as it was shaped uh, under Japanese power with the establishment of Manchukuo. Um, and the generation of Munjong Chang and the, this intermediate generation of uh, pseudo historians, um, I'm, I don't have all the details in the presentation here, but their careers when they were younger, pre 1945, were in the Japanese Empire. They nearly all had careers. They were not independence activists. Um, it's, it's hard, they were somewhere between pro-Japanese empire or simply seeking their fortune, like pursuing their careers as best they can under the circumstances 
in the Japanese Empire. Um, but this meant they grew up exposed to um, that period of understanding of Manchuria and the Japanese imperialist ideology that imagined um, a history of Manchuria, um, and that particularly tried to tie it to Korea as well, because the Japanese had invaded and annexed Korea. Now they were annexing uh, or taking control of Manchuria. And they came up with a histori historiographical um, justification saying that Korea and Manchuria were a natural single entity. Uh, this is the Mansen idea of Mansen, Manchuria, Chosen, Manson, uh, Yoksa uh, Kwan, view of history. So we can see now all three maps are the same. Edo Kill 2016, we can trace back to Munjong Chang of 1969, uh, back to the Manchukuo map of 1934 here. And there are many other publications. We could add more maps, but this is just to give an um, uh, overview of the, how we can trace back uh, this idea. So that, that's the explanation for, or this helps to historicize the map that Edok Hill promotes as a territory of old Chosun. We can historicize it by going back to um, the Manch Manchukuo map. And just to finish then, we can also try to historicize the idea of Huanguk, um, the proto-civilization of Central Asia uh, that we've looked at as well, as illustrated in An Gyeong John's 2012 edition of Huan Dan Kogi uh, in the introduction, he's added these maps. So this was another, this idea of Central Asian origins, um, uh, we can also trace back. So to this intermediate generation, uh, this is a map from 1978 uh, from the magazine Jayu, uh, translates as Liberty. This was the magazine, as mentioned, this was one of the magazines that was the, kind of the mouthpiece uh, for the group, most active group promoting pseudo history uh, in from the late 60s and then really in the 1970s. Um, this, so this magazine also carried the early early draft versions of bits of the Huan Dan Kogi, um, and they also promoting ideas such as Huan Guk. So you see here, again, it's very vague. They just put it um, up here in this general area. Um, actually, not an earlier map, slightly more recent one, 1988. Uh, here, it's promoting Pedal, which had been the, um, in the current periodization, we saw Pedal is in between Huanguk and Old Chosun, um, but that's not completely set at this stage. Um, but anyway, here you see extremely uh, generous territory of uh, Pedal um, being, well, don't need to describe it, you can just see there um, how large a territory they're claiming. This interest in Central Asia and the idea of Central Asian Asian origins um, is a discourse that's uh, evolved over the 20th century and is still very present today. Um, so among the less reliable, less uh, critical histories you can find today, um, quite often there'll be ones that explore the idea of Central Asian origins. Um, there are some aspects of uh, cultural flow between Central Asia uh, and Korea. So there are responsible, there's uh, critically, resp I always go, critically responsible, responsibly critical approaches uh, in which you can uh, look at connections between the Three Kingdoms period um, and early Korea uh, and Central Asia. Um, but the less critical version that ultimately becomes pseudo history um, imagines ancient, ultimately imagine something like Huan Guk, like the, the origins of Korean civilization uh, spreading out uh, with kind of rather romantic ideas of migrations across um, the steppe of the Korean people. So we see here in the translation of the sub, or well, the title is In Search of Korean People's DNA, um, really imagining kind of genetic origins uh, in Central Asia, pursuing the history of a Northern empire spread over the Eurasian steppe and the origins of the Korean people. So these ideas are present in recent publications. Um, and we can trace this back to uh, the premise of um, the, ultimately it's premised on uh, a, 
hypothesis of language family, the Altaic language family. Um, and this is a idea that developed in the mid to late 19th century um, and then was quite uh, regarded as a genuine hypothesis for the spread of um, certain language groups, which are grouped as the uh, Altaic languages, um, including the Turkic, Mongolic, Tungusic, and possibly adding Korean and sometimes Japanese um, languages. So this would be the Altaic language family group. Um, this hypothesis started to uh, be to kind of fall apart uh, mid 20th century, and it is no. There are some people who still promote it, um, but it's no longer the consensus view of historical linguists uh, is that it is not. Um, there was not a single Altaic language family that spread out from a single location in the in the Altai Mountains. Um, but among pseudo historians in Korea, it's still a very much a working premise um, that there was one group, um, and such as we see in the example of Hwan Guk, uh, they would imagine that there was a single language they originally had that also spread out. So we see an intermediate example of um, the search for Korean origins in Central Asia um, from uh, 1970, Pak Shi Yin, uh, who is one of the court, one of the group of the pseudo historians. Um, it's a bit of a crazy, it's a bit difficult to see the details of this uh, map. Um, but if you recall arrows, um, imagining kind of flows of uh, people or culture or DNA, uh, we see this here. Um, with uh, an arrow coming along here, um, something going on here, a circle, um, and then something going on here, another circle, perhaps old Joseon, as we see here. Um, these ideas and interest in uh, pan Eurasian ethnic uh, connections and uh, shared origins can be traced back to uh, tour the um, ideology of Turinism or the um, theory of Turinism. Uh, and this is uh, similar, it's very similar to the language, uh, it's kind of the same thing as the, the language hypothesis of the Altaic languages. In their earliest form um, of the language hypothesis, it was rather the Ural Altaic language hypothesis, in which case it included the Uralic languages of, uh, of course, the greatest language, Finnish. Um, and Estonian, um, and these were imagined, or, or they were thought this, they were thought to be uh, potentially related to other languages of um, Trans Eurasia, the Turkic languages, the Mongolic languages, and the Tungusic languages, and the Korean languages, um, and the Japanese languages. And Turinism was promoted um, during the Japanese Empire. Um, also as an ideology um, for Japanese imperial expansion. Um, it wasn't the only one, so it wasn't, the, it wasn't necessarily the, the main ideology all the time uh, for justifying the Japanese empire, but it was, pr it was promoted within that context. Um, so it could help justify Japan's expansion into Northeast Asia by saying that they're reunifying uh, the, 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 tr the, the Ural Altaic peoples or the, the Tur Turinist peoples, uh, if you will. Um, so this provides a context. Um, I'll, that's the last slide I'm think. Yeah, that's the last slide I'm going to show. Um, so we can see Japanese Turinism of the imperial uh, pre-1945 period. Um, and you can see how it covers this general area, which uh, to finish up is the general area um, of the outside language hypothesis uh, to come back, which is a general area of Huan Guk, as we see here. So this is how we could, uh, as a history of ideas, very condensed, of course, there's a lot more needs to be said, but just to keep it simple in uh, maps, uh, we can trace the interest uh, to Turinism. Okay. So that's the, the end of uh, what I have prepared as uh, quite an epic presentation for you. Um, 
good job. I see people are still here and still uh, awake. So thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for this presentation. Uh, it was very complex. And uh, I think there are many things we can, we can discuss uh, using it as a starting point. I'd like to um, invite the students to ask questions first. Um, what is the redis rediscovery of Korea book about? Um, also about Mimana uh, of uh, Kaya, uh, rediscovery of Kaya. As on, um, you say the book. Yes. Which book? A uh, rediscovery of Kaya. Uh, the um, in the early career project. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that is uh, a very good book. Um, actually, I have it on my shelf. I can uh, show you the contents. Um, but so it basically has um, uh, chapters written by historians and archaeologists looking at the critical available evidence for Kaya um, and also looking at the 20th century historiography of how people have studied and how Kaya and Mimana uh, have been used in the 20th century. Um, so by rediscovery, and then they put that in the title, partly to be a, cap a catchy title, um, because for history and archeology, span we always like the idea of kind of discovering something new, rediscovering um, something. Uh, it reflects that Kaya has been understudied especially in English language or international scholarship. Um, so actually before the early career project, um, there, there, there's some scholarship on that international scholarship or English language scholarship on early career, but very limited um, and very lit especially very little on the archeology. span um, So I would take a get, I would, I haven't, I need to double check, but I would take a guess and say uh, there's close to nothing, very, very little had been published on the archaeology uh, relating to the area of Kaya um, in English language. So in that sense, it's a re it's just, a, I mean, it's partly branding, but it's rediscovering or making, re making accessible uh, the latest research um, on Kaya archaeology. And with uh, archaeology in South Korea because it's very um, it's uh, continuing to develop uh, so in a sense there's rediscoveries because they are publishing new research they're also making new discoveries even in Korean language um, so from that aspect it's making the latest research available and through that research we uh, like the ideal is that we rediscover the ancient polity of Kaya at least we can, redis we can discover uh, what it is possible to know about it at the moment through the sources and through the archeology. span Especially with Kaya, because it had become a very taboo topic uh, due to the way that um, during the Japanese period, pre-1945, um, the Japanese had asserted that the entity, the early entity, this Mimana, um, they said that this was the organ through which Japan in ancient times and early period had uh, supposedly uh, colonized and controlled southern Korean peninsula, um, which is not a, is not a historically uh, um, supportable uh, view of history, but that was convenient to justify Japanese uh, invasion and colonization of Korea in the 20th century to say that they had done that. And we've done it before, so we're going to do it again. Um, that to say that like Korea started under ancient Japanese domination. So it's the natural state for us to do that. And they'd emphasized Kaya um, and they uh, equated it. Kai, within Kaya, Kaya is really complicated because it's made up of, historically, it, was, it wasn't a single state. Uh, it was made up of multiple uh, small states, polities. One of these is called uh, Imna, or that's the Korean pronunciation and the Japanese pronunciation of Imna is Mimana. 
Um, so the Japanese had focused on Mimana and said this was the Japanese organ. Because they'd done that, uh, post-1945, uh, in a context in Korea where they were trying to decolonize um, and uh, basically sort of decolonize these ideas of early history as they've been imposed by Japanese scholars. Um, Mimana and by extension Kaya became almost a taboo topic uh, because it was because it had been so used by the Japanese. Um, it was a topic that people tried to just because it's also a bit complicated because there are connections with Japan in it. So it was a very kind of dangerous waters, thin ice to step on uh, in the post-1945 period. So Kaya, study of Kaya was in relative to other bits of early Korean history, uh, it was neglected by South Korean historians. Um, and then even more so in English language scholarship, it was relative like there was a little bit of work on it but relatively it was under examined and so the recent volume of the early career project that was to introduce uh new res new research on the topic thank you other questions I have some questions regarding the new religion, Jung Sando. Um, what others think about this religion? How many worshippers uh, this religion has? Um, good questions. Uh, on the number of worshippers, I just say I can't uh, say at the moment. Um, I can't remember for one thing. Um, they do do census. They do censuses when they do national census. They record numbers of. Uh, religious believers of uh, the large religions. They don't, uh, Jung Sang Do is too small to be counted as a religion in the census. Um, I can't remember if it's, I think it's included in a kind of an other brackets or something like that. So it's actually hard to get statistics on, accurate statistics on the number of believers. Rather, you'd have to trust what the religion themselves, what they claim to be their number of believers. Um, but they're likely to possibly exaggerate. Um, it's, so Jung Sang Do seems to be uh, among the, these new religious organizations. Jung Sang Do uh, is very visible because it has this huge media organization behind it. So it's seemingly thriving. Um, and it seems to have, uh, for example, younger generations of believers as well and practitioners. Whereas some of the other new religions they generally seem to be declining in that they were thriving for a bit in the 20th century, but they're failing kind of to, to regenerate themselves. So Jung Sang Do, uh, from the study of uh, current religions, it's very interesting as a phenomenon because it seems pretty healthy. Um, I can only guess at the numbers of believers. Um, I would consider it certainly thousands, uh, definitely. Um, but yeah, I, I won't say any more because I don't know. Um, what people, what other people think about it. Um, this is quite interesting with Jung Sang Do as well. And I can kind of only speak from anecdotal understanding of what uh, Koreans and things have told me. Um, so on the whole, at least until recently, they haven't connected Jung Sang Do to pseudo history. Um, and Jung Sang Do as an organization, they're quite careful to separate the names um, so rather they use for the branding of their pseudo history for the TV station and things, they use this branding of Sang Sang uh, and they keep Jung Sang Do only as kind of the name of the, uh, the religion uh, without any kind of direct reference to Huan Dan Koki or pseudo history. So Jung Sang Do, when people hear about Jung Sang Do, they tend to just understand it as um, something like a meditation cult or a meditation school. Um, basically, they see it as, uh, so this is me projecting onto how I would understand how uh, the non Jung Sang Do practitioner Koreans view it. They see it as a bit weird, um, but harmless, uh, I would suggest. Um, and for a time, it was pretty much understood as being kind of uh, good for meditation. So one anecdotal story I can say, and this like anecdotes are not uh, 
substitutes for good research. Um, but a Korean friend told me that uh, his brother, uh, the, their parents sent his brother to Jung Sang Do meditation camp uh, just because he was hyperactive and a bit naughty and things. And they just thought it was like a good place to send him. Um, so I think it has a reasonably, uh, yeah, it, people don't see it as being dangerous as such. Mm -hmm. um, new, new religions more broadly, they have developed, so new religions can be split in career between uh, Christian-based new religions and what are seen as more, more like kind of nativist uh, new religions, Korean or drawing from East Asian traditions. So Jung Sang Do is in the nativist camp. Um, they don't have so high profile, uh, so there, there's not too much, there's not so much a negative view of them. They're just seen as being perhaps a bit eccentric because um, uh, it's kind of like people wanting to uh, recreate ancient religion, um, such as so maybe maybe not too dissimilar to how in Europe, and I can think about UK, um, how new age religion is viewed um, as being, either you can say it's kind of an okay thing to do, or you can think it's weird, um, it, that's, but no one is not seen as the major problem. Um, the, within new religions uh, that have evolved in the 20th century, there's also the Christian uh, sects, and they're seen as being much more problematic Last year, one came to prominence in the context of the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, you may have heard the name of Shincheonji, um, because early on uh, in the pandemic, when South Korea was supposedly doing well with uh, stopping the spread of the pandemic, then they suddenly had this case uh, in, in a church, and the church through which it spread uh, was this church of Shincheonji which is one of the 20th century uh, new Christian religions. Um, there's, a, there's a, broadly, there's a similarity between, or there's a commonality between the Christian new religions and the nativist Korean new religions in that they both have a millenarian aspect to them. This uh, kind of belief in the future coming. Of course, the Christian ones, the future coming is like a new Christian Messiah. And the leaders of these uh, Christian new religions, they claim to be that new messiah. So they claim to be the second coming. Um, so this is looked at more negative, because South Korea has quite, as you probably noticed, has quite um, strong Christian uh, practice uh, among the population, not the majority, but still it's very substantial. They look very negatively on, and they look negatively on any other religion um, but then especially the new religions and especially the, the Christian new religions because they see them as heresies. Um, so that's uh, go, going slightly going beyond your question. Um, but so I would say Jung Sang Do is regarded as relatively just something a bit, a bit odd, but safe, um, not a major threat. But uh, more broadly, new religions uh, have been looked at critically, um, but that's more been triggered by the Christian new religions, um, especially Shincheonji, because it had the misfortune uh, to have the pandemic uh, outbreak occur at their church. And there, they have like um, a, a Bible or like um, uh, those uh, 10 Christian commandments that we have um, our Christians. Uh, they have something like this too. Uh, yes, they do. And I'm just trying to find it. So I'll just share my screen quickly. Um, this is from another presentation. It's just PDFs. Uh, so the Chung Sang Do Bible uh, is, on, let's see if I've got the full version. Here it is. Um, it's called this. It's called the um, Chung Sang Do Torjon. Uh, and this is a recent, pub this is the most up to date publication you can get of it. Um, it's quite large. Um, and it's based on an earlier text. So the earliest kind of Jung San scripture uh, was compiled um, in the 1920s. Um, and that's still circulated. The Jung San religion splintered um, and there's other Jung San religions still surviving um, in Korea. Uh, they're less visible, but they are uh, surviving. Um, so this is a recent edition of the original scripture 
Um, so as it's been republished in 2019, interestingly, but this, so this is basically uh, the same version as was first put together in 1929. The Jung Sang version uh, under An Gyeong John, they've massively supplemented it, uh, which becomes an interesting topic in itself. So we can see the, um, that just how much has been added to this. Um, from the view, as you said, like, do they have a Bible? You can see that the way it's designed is to be a Bible. Uh, it's leather bound uh, with a gold leaf. You can get cheaper versions of it. This is the most fancy version uh, of it. So very much, and this is a feature of the new religions uh, from the early 20th, early 20th century um, and shows how they were influenced by uh, Christianity. Um, uh, so Christianity, especially Protestant Christianity, as it was introduced by missionaries in the 1880s, it was associated with modernism. Uh, and so it brought the idea of modern religion. Of course, Korea has long religious history, very rich. Um, but this idea of like having, having an official religion and having a, a, a book, a Bible, um, so the new religious organizations, they model themselves in that way. So this is the Jung Sang Bible, uh, if you will. Um, and you can see inside it, it's actually, oh, I can zoom in. Uh, it's very much uh, written like a Bible. So you have chapter and verses. This is the Jung Sang Do version. I say they massively supplemented it with uh, lots of photos um, and also um, uh, testimonies, witness testimonies. So what's interesting is, as similar to the Christian Bible, or the New Testament that tells the story of Jesus based on the people who kind of had hung out with him and then they wrote down uh, their gospels. Um, so the, they, this, the greater part of this is a Bible, it tells the story of uh, Jung Sang Gang Yeo Sun, the historical um, messiah who started the religion uh, in the early 20th century. And An Gyeong Jong claims to have gone around and interviewed people uh, who have some distant memory of that. Of course, now, uh, in most cases, they're not quite old enough to directly remember. Um, or, but some of them, you see, some of them are pretty ancient. And he did this uh, in the 1990s. So actually they would have been just old, like some of the oldest that he interviewed, they have kind of childhood memories connected to uh, Kang Il Sun. So it's really interesting because he's gone to huge lengths um, to record this oral testimony. And I don't think that, um, I don't think it's entirely invented. Like Jung Sang is a legitimate, is a legitimate something that happened in the early 20th century, a movement. It was based in the, by the way, North Chola province uh, in the Southwest in North Chola, uh, which is also an area central to Maitreya Buddhist practice historically. Um, so this is again in a book, he shows this is a young An Gyeong John uh, at work in the 1990s recording the testimonies um, that, and through these, so he makes the claim that through these testimonies, he was able to much improve uh, the Jung Sang scripture. Yeah, so good question on the Bible, because, um, and that shows so this topic, I originally approached this topic through uh, researching first pseudo history, then I discovered that the, that this, that new religion played a role, um, especially currently with the, the power of um, Jung Sang Do. Um, but then almost kind of separate, uh, the history of Jung Sang, the history of these new religions is very interesting to study in its own right. Um, and if it wasn't for the fact that, that Ang Gyeong Jong is also promoting pseudo history, um, I wouldn't criticize it. I would see it as something interesting as a, um, uh, whether you believe the religion or not, but you can see it as a very interesting, very rich uh, tradition um, and very interesting for local history of the region of North uh, Chola province. Thank you. I also have a question. I think it's a bit similar to the previous one, but I was wondering how are the supporters or promoters of 
uh, pseudo history seen by the general public and especially by the younger generation. And also, isn't there any opposition to the pseudo historians kind of distorting uh, historical facts? That's a really good question as well. Um, so, uh, and my, my answers are gonna be very generalized to like take that into account that I can't give like very uh, exact answers, but to generalize, um, until recently, uh, people, the public opinion of the pseudo history, it hasn't recognized it as pseudo history um, because people don't have the training in history to know. Um, so the public opinion uh, has either been simply either you're interested in it or you're not interested in it. Um, so if you're not interested in history, then you just don't care at all. Um, but if you're interested in history and you don't have training uh, as a, you haven't majored in history and you don't have kind of training in critical study of sources or archeology, span uh, the most likelihood is that you believe it um, because the pseudo historians they don't, although here I've kind of emphasized the connection to new religion, um, that for the most part, they present themselves as, uh, they present themselves as critical scholars and they say, we have evidence and they, their evidence is very flawed, um, but people don't know that. So it's very believable if you look, at, if you just read the books, it looks like they know what they're talking about. Um, they, ref they talk about sources, they talk about archeology, span um, in reality, they get it all wrong, um, but you cannot know that unless you really study it critically. Even for myself, when I started, um, so I, I fell into this topic in my PhD research um, because originally I was just interested in the idea of uh, popular history. Um, and being, I'd seen in Korea that in the Korean history sections in the bookstores, it's quite a few interesting books on early history. Um, and so I, just started reading them uh, with, a, with an open mind, because um, I didn't know better myself. I didn't know early history so well myself. Um, so I was actually hoping to be educated by these books that I could learn um, about the past. Um, some of them you could tell that they were dodgy and that they were clearly like exaggerating things. Um, but in other cases, including Edoc Hill, they seemingly come with very secure evidence. Um, and it took a long time and kind of very careful reading uh, to work out what is going on, how they are misrepresenting the evidence, um, and then also to research kind of to understand the, the historical, the, as just shown then, kind of to understand, to trace how this has developed. Um, so generally in Korea, your average Korean, if they are interested in history and have not had if they've not majored in history at university, for example, they, they're likely to believe it. Um, it also tells you a good story. It tells you ancient Korea was uh, this huge empire. It's very exciting uh, and maybe very kind of satisfying to know, um, especially against the context of feeling that you're living in a divided country um, as well. So there may, there's a kind of perhaps a psychological uh, attraction to it. Um, which is true in other countries as well. Everyone likes to imagine they've got a great history. Coming to the second part of your question about has no one like kind of challenged this. Um, so uh, in scholarship uh, or, or in professional scholarship, historians and archeologists at university. Um, so there's a history of clashing with the pseudo historians that goes back to when the pseudo historians first really started organizing in the 1970s and started lobbying the government complaining about the content, the content of school textbooks. Um, and they started throwing this allegation against uh, professional scholars saying that they were only continuing Japanese era historiography. Professional historians tried to respond to this. Um, particularly, there was a moment in the 1980s when they tried to respond to it. Um, but the government, essentially the government supported uh, the narrative told by the pseudo historians, the, the military government of the 1980s was also very happy with the idea of having having a grand ancient history. Um, and this was when it was also started to be popular, uh, popularized through, I think, some representation in newspapers and things like this became a public debate, a public discourse 
um, moving beyond just their magazine where they'd been publishing it amongst themselves. Um, it became much more of a national level uh, discussion. And again, the public opinion was in support of pseudo history. Um, so it was very uh, difficult for critical scholars to challenge it, especially publicly, because they would get there would be public backlash and criticism against them. And that's continued. This was repeated uh, in the example we've shown recently in 2014, 2015, when the National Assembly uh, held the hearings, which essentially the national, the, the committee members, the politicians, they were very sympathetic to the position of the pseudo historians and they were unsympathetic themselves to critical historians. So um, certain professors were called to this committee and then they had to kind of defend themselves um, against accusations that they were promoting um, Japanese scholarship. Uh, and this created this drama and this big event uh, um, in itself and with the termination of those projects. Um, at the time, the broader professional establishment of uh, historians in Korea, uh, they did not respond very strongly. Um, and there is some dissatisfaction uh, that they didn't respond, that they were silent at the beginning. Um, this is partly because they'd had the experience of trying in the 1980s and only found a found very hostile response from the public and from, from the government as well. Um, so they were very cautious not to respond. This was also the period of the Park geun administration, the, the um, conservative administration of Park geun um, which ended with her impeachment for corruption. Um, and you may have heard about under this time, the, the government was, had uh, blacklists against people who they considered like um, uh, not supportive of uh, all manner of things, not supportive of their politics. And the Park geun administration, uh, they had a blacklist also of academics um, because there was a debate over modern, modern history. Um, and the Park geun administration tried to impose uh, a nationally authored textbook, a, a single government history textbook um, that would replace at the, the system of there being various uh, textbooks published by different publishers. Um, and this was a throwback to the 1970s when there was a single government authored textbook. Uh, this has been explained concern, the bigger concern for the Park geun administration was representation of modern history obviously representation of Park Jong-hee, her own father, and the authoritarian era. This was the project of the New Right historians, a group of historians who uh, are very concerned with positive representation of uh, the autocratic governments of Park Jong-hee and Chon Doo-hwan. Um, their key, they were not so interested in ancient history, but they were still supportive of um, uh, the idea of a grand history again. So the atmosphere at that time, the political atmosphere was one where uh, individuals uh, could be blacklisted by the government, which would mean they wouldn't be able to get funding and this kind of things. Um, so people were quite like genuinely, there was a sense of, um, uh, again, just keep it simple. People were a bit scared at that time. They weren't gonna talk out. They weren't gonna take the risk. Um, but what the response that came was from the slightly younger generation of uh, scholars who at the time they were themselves uh, like PhD students. Um, and since then, uh, they're now active as young generation uh, scholars of history. And they've responded very rigorously um, in recent years. Um, so there's been a series of uh, books published um, in a style, popular history books, so books that are popularly accessible, um, written that very strongly criticize pseudo history and debunk it, um, explain to non-professionals why the, the evidence of the pseudo historians is false. Um, so this is a new movement, um, it's very interesting, uh, and it's come about in the recent, I'm just trying to think about, so it started in about 2016, uh, this, this, uh, they literally called themselves in their first publications the um, uh, the Young Historians Association. Um, and from 
2016, they published a series of uh, first academic articles that really attacking um, the pseudo historians. Um, and then they published a series in a newspaper, Hangyole 21 uh, magazine. There's a famous Hangyole newspaper, um, and there's a, a magazine newspaper associated with it called Hangyole 21. Um, this Hangyole uh, often has publications, columns, and articles by pseudo historians. Um, but the Hangyole 21 magazine gave space uh, to, this, to these uh, trained young historians who ran a column criticizing, deconstructing pseudo history, historicizing it, all these kind of things. Uh, and they've continued very vigorously. And to a degree, that's put pseudo historians, Edok Hill and others, slightly on the back, slightly on a defensive position. Um, because these books published have really exposed uh, the weaknesses of their argumentation. One of their strategies has been to, to show the link, just as I've shown slightly here, to show the link of the pseudo historians ideas, far from being this kind of patriotic lineage of uh, independence, left wing independence fighters, um, that actually these ideas are rooted in uh, ultimately Japanese fascism and imperialism. Uh, which very uh, this this line of uh, exposure uh, is a good strategy to undermine uh, the kind of moral claims, the political legitimacy that the pseudo historians uh, claim. The still, how much impact this will have on the general Korean public uh, is limited because the pseudo historians they publish so often the same content, but they keep repackaging it. So every few months, there'll be a new book uh, published by the pseudo historian, uh, often E. Doc Hill, but also uh, there's many others as well. Um, and while this young generation of scholars, so they, they've got plenty of energy to fight back, but it's a really hard uh, battle to maintain in the public realm, because you basically have to keep on pumping out uh, new books just to say the same thing again. Um, but just because you say it once, uh, books don't stay in print for very long in Korea. Um, often they only have one or two prints, print runs of uh, paperback books, um, and then they disappear. Uh, so you've got to write a new book just to keep perpetuating the ideas. But they've also done, they've had a, they have a podcast as well um, called Yoksa uh, Gongjakdang. Uh, um, the, it's a broader organized Manian Manset Yoksa Gongjakdang podcast and things. So they're trying quite hard to publicize and not just to criticize, so there's two angles of their strategy. First was just to really criticize the pseudo historians to show how wrong they are to debunk their methodologies, et cetera. But of course that's very negative and like that doesn't really attract people to the field uh, if you just see angry people uh, complaining about pseudo history. So what they're trying to make up for is to produce more accessible, uh, responsible, representations of history, so popular historiography. It's been a field that's been dominated by pseudo historians because the professional uh, historians, for whatever reason, were not so actively publishing books that were accessible to the general public. Um, so this younger generation, not only the younger generation, but especially this younger generation now, they've really started to move uh, to make history accessible um, to the general public through books, through podcasts. Um, they're also doing an internet TV show, uh, these kind of things. Thank you. Thank you. I also have a question, a, a brief one. Uh, when I teach ancient history, I often try to present uh, contradicting narratives. And some of them are very far-fetched. Um, and students often ask me, what happens to the archaeological evidence in these narratives? So I, I, I think this is a very good question for your, um, your topic. Um, these pseudo historians, how do they treat archaeological evidence regarding, for instance, Old Choson and the extension of Old Choson? Yeah, so the pseudo historians themselves uh, claim to have evidence. They claim to have textual arguments and they claim to have uh, archaeological evidence. Um, the uh, just very quick way 
to say how they treat the archaeology of old Chaucer on this, they start with a predefined massive territory and then anything archaeological found in that territory, they say that's old Chaucer. So uh, it's, um, uh, what's the fancy word for like starting with, um, I can't think now, but anyway, that's what they do. Uh, so they start with, uh, they have the predefined territory um, and then just anything in it, they say that's old Chaucer. Um, and some of this is Chinese archaeology, if you go west. Um, so you have the um, Warring States period of Yan. Uh, and a lot of that, they say, actually, that's not Chinese. That's old Chaucer. Um, examples, a key example are the so-called knife coins. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think they're bronze. Bronze knife coins, um, which were used uh, in different Chinese states uh, of the Warring States period, including Yan. Um, but in Edoc Hill's book, uh, and many others, they present this, they say this is old Chaucer money, uh, and they show the Yan knife coins, uh, but they just rebrand it, they say it's old Chaucer. Um, so basically, anything in the territory that they claim, they say, well, that's old Chaucer, so there's evidence. Um, Can you explain how, how they are connected to a Korean identity? Uh, Yep, so some of these they try to, they, so they use certain items, especially to map out uh, mm -hmm. the territory of Old Chorson and to say that these are very Korean uh, items. Um, uh, so the two keys, key examples are um, bronze daggers and the, the uh, Tolman uh, megaliths. Um, the Tolman burials, so the large stone burials. So there's a distribution of these uh, burials um, th throughout uh, south southern Manchuria. Actually, I can Hong, I can open the map on this uh, in my files. Um, so what they do is they make distribution maps where they show how these items are distributed in the territory, and then they say that's our territory. Uh, let's see if I can. I might be able to find this quickly because I've been using it for teaching. Quite, uh, similar to professional historiography. Yeah, so then it, go, then it goes into um, how you treat uh, the concept of material culture, um, archaeological cultures. And this is like a key question of archaeological practice and, the, and how you div what you interpret from the material evidence. Um, the critical view now is that material evidence doesn't directly equate to uh, ethnic identity. Um, so you can have a distribution of certain material items, but that distribution doesn't guarantee, it doesn't map out a political boundary. It doesn't necessarily, doesn't necessarily map out uh, an ethnic boundary, especially not on the scale that they're claiming for their territory. So sometimes treated as a better uh, material index um, is something like earthenware, where you might have a local style of pottery, a local style of earthenware, um, or earthenware or um, house design, uh, like um, the shape of a house uh, or residential dwelling as it can be re recovered. Um, those can often be, you can find in like a, a more, a smaller area, a small regional area. Um, you might find a very common group of similar earthenware, similar housing types. Um, in that case, that's a, a more reliable indicator that you've got some kind of group of people uh, that have a shared, some kind of shared identity, shared practices. But across the, the, um, the incredible expanse of territory that they're claiming as if it's a single group of people or a single political entity. Um, it's just, it's completely unrealistic in the first place. Um, and within that kind of immense territory, uh, so the bronze daggers are a good example because, uh, so bronze daggers uh, are spread over, not quite as much as the territory Edoc Hill claims, but nevertheless, they're spread over quite a wide territory. But bronze daggers are a, um, uh, what's the word, like um, uh, a recepum, a prestige item um, that uh, uh, the elite wants. Um, and it's basically it's less representative of uh, 
local communities as it is of um, the spread of prestige items um, on a higher level, basically. Right, thank you. Other questions? All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Logi, for this very good um, presentation on Korean pseudo history. I think uh, we we've got a lot to to learn. Also, it was a very good introduction on some new religious movements, which I I couldn't cover during my course. So thank you again. It's been absolutely my pleasure. Um, thank you to everyone for um, uh, staying alert. Uh, everyone I see in the camera screen, it's been uh, great to be able to um, uh, talk to you for this time. Um, not often that I get to like open up on so much uh, over three hours like that. So um, thank you for your attention. Uh, if you have questions or uh, researching this topic in the future, writing essays and things, feel uh, free to contact me. Um, and I hope sometime to see you in person, uh, whether visiting uh, Cluj, uh, or if you happen to drop by Helsinki sometime. Uh, thank you. Thank you.